I'll do a bit longer introduction now, as I've got a bit more time. So I'm James Lennon. I am the Cyclum Product Director. I have two parts to my role. One is helping our clients become and leverage uh, products the best they can. And the second is for us to create and build our own SaaS pass products to take to market. There's two parts to it. Uh, I've worked at Big Four Consulting to small digital, uh, small digital design agencies to technology companies as product manager and product director. So I like to think I've got each one of those three circles covered. I've worked in design, I've worked in business, I've worked in the technology side. I'm gonna take you through a few different things today. Uh, one is what actually is a product manager. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguity around the term. It means lots of different things to lots of different companies. So I'm gonna talk through what, how we see it, what we see the role is. Then what our product approach is, how we do it in Cyclum, how we go about that, and then the challenges we face. There's a lot of stuff that comes from Silicon Valley, lots of advice, lots of ways to do things that works really well in the startup but actually extremely difficult in the enterprise or sometimes just unfeasible to even do in the enterprise. So I'll go through examples of basically where I've got it wrong, where we need to tweak the approach and where we need to deal with uh, difficult stakeholders like what we've mentioned before. What advice would give to a product manager? So all the years have done this, what are the most important things? What are the most powerful tips and tricks uh, that have been most useful to me? And then finally, what do you go and do now? What is the top things to take from this talk that you could actually go and apply when you get back to your desk? So let's start with the three circles. We've talked about this as the product fundamentals. In the middle of this is the sweet spot where you get out competing product and you need to have each one of these three in equal measure to get anywhere. We're gonna say the product manager brings in the business side of stuff. Some people in the audience will look at that and go, I completely disagree. They should be here right in the middle. And I absolutely agree with you. They are there right in the middle. That is the sweet spot. That's where the product manager should be. They should be pulling in the user, technology, and business parts. They should be pulling all of that in from each member of their product team because their role is to make that sweet spot as hard to miss as possible. They're there to bring that all together. A bit generic. Should we get a bit more specific about what we mean? There's many, many ways of getting product management right. There's a very few common ways of getting it wrong. So what we'll do is we'll define what's wrong, the not to do, and then what's left will be the <coughs> successful part, the easy bit. So first, what a product manager isn't. They are not a project manager. They are not a product owner. They are not a business analyst. A lot of clients, customers, they tend to just pick up a product owner, some like certified scrum product owner and then just lift and shift them into the role or they'll get a project manager and push them in Sorry. Uh, and then with business analyst it's a different role again product management is a very distinct different set of skills these two they're concerned with delivery this some of discovery but not in quite the way that we've talked about a product manager is equal parts continuous discovery continuous delivery then when we talk around idea generation, they're not the sole idea generator. They are not the Steve Jobs that says, here's exactly what we're gonna do and this is the vision for the product and how great all the features are gonna be. They're not the person that comes up with that. They do contribute ideas, but they're not the sole idea generator. And then finally, they're not the boss. A lot of times people will say a product manager is the mini CEO. I can see why they say that. A lot of a CEO's qualities, if you've got the right CEO, of course, a lot of those qualities are what you'd expect in a product manager, but they do not make the final call. They're not the one making the final decision and saying this, this, and this every single time. They're not the one saying this is what you should do today. What they are is they are the ultimate facilitator. They're bringing the best ideas from their team together. They're bringing the best out of each member of their team, and they're making their team decide what to do and where to go as a team. They're also the evangelizer. This is where the CEO one works because they're the chief evangelizer officer. But they should be going around telling everyone in the business why product is the best way to do this, why this product is good, why this product is beneficial for the business. They won't gloss over where it's weak. They'll acknowledge that there's improvements to be made but they are the biggest evangelizer for the product. They tell the customers, marketing, sales, legal, they get everyone on board for this journey. 
And then finally, they act as an editor. So what do I mean by that? A journalist will come up with an idea. They will write their article and they'll give it to the editor who will then tweak it to make it sharper, more impactful, and more accepting to users and readers. And that's exactly what the product manager does. They take the best ideas from all of their team, from how they've came up with everything, and then they tweak it to be more acceptable to the business. They tweak it to be more acceptable to users. They tweak it to just make it a bit more punchy and powerful. A skilled product manager is above all accountable. If the product is successful, it's because of a good product team. If the product is failing, it's because of a bad product manager. They are the ultimate accountable person for the success of the product and they have to act in that way and be accountable. It might not be their fault, but it's their problem to deal with. They're also very data literate. We learn a lot through discovery when we're doing our user testing interviews and we're testing prototypes. We get a lot of information, but we get almost as much, sometimes even more, afterwards when the product's launched and we see the analytics of how the users have actually went into it. They need to be data literate, they need to understand those analytics, understand those messages, and then decide with the team to make a data-driven decision to improve that product. They're also holistic. They're each part of those three circles. They need to sit across everything. They need to make sure that they've got in their mind the business strategy and how this works for the strategy, how their product helps the business achieve the goals it needs to. They need to also understand the customer as much as possible to really understand that plight, those issues, so they can empathize. And then finally, have an understanding of the technology, have an understanding of what it means to actually develop and go through those issues and not ask the impossible. They also need to be very entrepreneurial. This is where the mini CEO one comes into play. It's not just the product manager's job to make the product as best as it can. It's also to flush out unmet business needs unmet user needs, to find new opportunities, new products to go after, new things that they can go and invest in. And then finally, highly resilient. A lot of ambiguity, a lot of different interpretations of the job. A product manager definition can be the same, but in two companies, the roles can be slightly different, just because of the way companies work and how different they are and the challenges they face. You've gotta be able to deal with that ambiguity with all those competing stakeholders, you've got thousands of stakeholders wanting different things. And then to handle that non-linear process, a lot of the times it's easy to spend too much time in a loop and not actually make that decision as a team to move out of it and actually go and deliver. Here's what our team structure usually looks like. Uh, it's, if you've seen the Spotify model, you'll recognize some of the ideas from here. But the idea is that you have a product team, eight to 10 people, the two pizza team, if you like, that team is cross-functional and has everything it needs to, to deliver for that team and discover for that team. So in this case, we have back-end development, front-end, product designers, data engineers, and a product manager within that team. They then rely on shared resources to augment that. As Yuri said, DevOps will be a part of it, but maybe not completely dedicated the whole time. Maybe it's a part-time role. Similarly for architecture, QA automation, user research, and agile coaches, they may not be needed, dedicated to each team, but they have access to it. Each of these teams works on its own set of non-dependent actions. What do I mean by that? Product team has everything it needs to deliver, and it doesn't have a dependency on product team too. You can have multiple product teams within one product, which then leads you to this portfolio picture. So some small products, you might just have the eight to 10 team, bigger ones, you might have multiple. When it comes over to this part, this one has three product teams within it. Each one has a product manager. And then there's the group product manager. In this role, it's not a separate person. So one of these three is the group product manager as well. The most senior of them, the most experienced will be the group product manager. They meet, they have their own team meetings to discuss because as ideally as we'd like to have no dependencies, but well, sometimes is, there's sometimes dependencies, even if you set them up as feature teams, you'll still have dependencies and it's up to those teams, that small team of product managers to work out those, reduce them as much as possible and reduce the impact. Then it goes up to our portfolio level. We have our group product managers for multiple products reporting in to the head of product in this case. Where we differ slightly is that we add the delivery director role so for some of our clients, 
version one is quite large. It kind of has to be. Maybe they're moving from one product to another. Maybe they've got obligations from regulation they have to match for whatever reason it could be. Delivery director is our role that keeps delivery on track for something so large. If there's a huge back end, for instance, and we might not need to do as much discovery testing on API product or something like that. And then they have the shared services. So at any time, everyone has access to, if it's already not in their team, they can go and draw on user research, quality assurance, as and when they need to, depending on what problem they're solving. So this one is a typical setup, generally, but this can tweak. You might have an API product, in which case there is no front end, so that changes completely. So we've got what a product manager is defined as. We've got what kind of structure they work in, or at least what they work in at Cyclum and our clients. What is the product approach? Well, a high level, the difference with the product approach is that it's always doing continuous discovery and continuous delivery. It does not matter if what you deliver is on time and on budget, if it's the wrong thing. That's one of those things you just throw away. That's on the scrap heap of product. It's important that we're always making sure we're building the right thing just as much as we are delivering uh, to a, at a good speed, at a good velocity. If you Google product approaches, you'll get a lot of different answers. You'll get this one, which is nice and simple. You can't disagree with it, but mm, there's not much you can do with that. You get this one, which is horrendously complicated and a bit scary and that no one really wants to do. And then finally, you get these ones, which just try really, really hard not to be linear. It's still linear if you stretched it out, but it tries really hard not to be. So, as I said at the beginning, the way we do it is an, a blended approach. You have to bring in all the best parts. This is our way of thinking about it. We have the best of design thinking, lean experiments, agile delivery and DevOps all in one. Is DevOps just completely confined to here? No, there's some overlap. Is the same with design thinking, lean experiments? No, there's some overlap, but this is a nice way to think about it. Does everything go completely from left to right every time? No. Does it go into loops sometimes? Yes. But generally speaking, a feature that's made it to the end and actually got to the user has at one point gone through these steps. Has at one point gone through an iteration, one point gone through it. We talked about each of these methodologies already um, in the previous talks. So let's talk about where does it go wrong when we put this into the enterprise, if we try this product manager definition, if we try this product approach, and then if we try uh, doing this structure, where does it go wrong? At what stage? Well, it's actually before you even start. Most of the time when we've worked with a client or a customer, it's gone wrong here. And the reason is they've done something called, or I like to call the protected team. And they do basically, let's get a team together. Let's take them out the organization. Let's put them in a separate room with bean bags and all this cool stuff, and we'll put them all in a corner, keep them protected, and it's their job to innovate and make product and change the whole business. The sentiment isn't completely wrong. I mean, starting out with one small team, yeah, that, that can make sense. But this approach inevitably leads to these sort of issues. Uh, usually the only way you get a team like this, the only way this happens, is if you have someone like the CEO directly sponsoring it. And then the team just uses the CEO to knock down every barrier and they rely on it. They just don't need to actually comply with that. We'll just knock it down. We don't need to worry about that piece. We'll just get them to overwrite the marketing guidelines or whatever it is. <laughs> Someone empathizes. And because of that, the business resists the change because who the hell wants to work with this team? They just knock down all the barriers. They're the ones that have been sent to the cool place that you're not invited to. The business resists the change. The business doesn't become the product business we talked about at the beginning. The ultimate goal is to become a product business. This business will now resist the change. And then what are you saying to that rest of that business? We've got the 10 people over here who are cool and intelligent. You're just the unwashed masses that, you know, will put you out of a job eventually when we automate everything. They're never gonna give the ideas. They're never gonna work with that team. It's never going to get anywhere. The business will just feel left out and they're either going to leave or just not share their ideas. And then the team gets devalued. Usually find most of the business will say that team doesn't do real work. They just mess around on whatever VR machine they've been given or whatever toys they have in certain of these teams. 
and they just devalue everything from that team and say it will never work i never want to work for it i don't want to invest in it my stuff's more important sometimes this will work sometimes that team despite all of this will still get one product or something valuable out of it but the problem is it will never scale if you add a second team what are you going to do have the cao knock down twice as many barriers it's never going to scale up so what can you do as a product manager what would we say uh, if you're in this situation first off don't use that ceo card that's the one that's going to get you in trouble and get your business resisting what you need to do there are some people no matter how much how clever you are in trying to convince them will never change don't start thinking you can change everyone's mind you can't every time but only use the ceo card when you absolutely have to at bare minimum try and work with the people my favorite thing to do is find out all the dependencies your product team has so we're trying to become a product organization we're not trying to make one product team work so we need to figure out that thread across the business where else do i need to talk to who else is involved in this process people from marketing legal and sales yes they need to be on board because i've got regulations to comply to and i need to be able to work with them same with marketing and sales i want my customers to know about it and i want to sell to them work out these dependencies across this thread across your business and then meet with the leader the the leaders of those teams and find out who their doer is now what's a doer in every team there's one person who does more work than the rest it's usually not the leader it's usually someone that works for them usually their second in command who does 80% of the work and is really respected in the team uh, gets a lot of stuff done any new stuff anything ambiguous gets chucked to that person you want to find out who that person is work with that leader to find who it is and then you want to make that person your best friend make that person feel like they're just as much a part of the product as they are their own team their success as a person is both linked to the product and their own team get them to the socials have them help and join in on a crazy eight uh, design session so they can feel like they're uh, contributing to the product a bit more send them the user interviews or better yet get them to observe get them to really understand and feel like they're part of the product team as much as possible and then just cling to this person for dear life because they're the ones that are going to help you change the department they're the ones that will help change the business because once they see what it is you're trying to achieve and they're on board with it they will make that new business process they will make that new way of working with legal and go oh for a product team we need to tweak this we still get the uh, the risk handled like we wanted to but now the process isn't getting in the way of something that needs to deliver fast and speak with users and then what happens if you have a second product team the people in the marketing department will then go to the other person and go how do you how do you do this how do you handle it that person's the one that they go to that's the person they trust they will follow that process they will be on board with it they will be ambitious to be like that person and that's how you get the thread across the business you've got to be working across it it's no point just having a separate isolated product team they'll never work you want to be a product led business there's another area where it goes wrong which is making up the teams a lot of enterprises usually start and they're on their journey and they go well i actually don't have a product manager i don't have product designers i might not have developers but everyone from silicon valley tells me i need it all co-located and this principle is true a co-located team will substantially outperform a dispersed team and the reason for that is people can make these relationships they can see what you're doing they can chat about it they can understand you but the problem with that is that assumes you've got access to the same talent locally as you do globally if you could reach out the second one's also true the right person in the right role is 10 times better than the wrong person in the wrong role which leads me to the conclusion and what we've done in the past is that actually a person even if not local will be more effective if they're the right person but that still leaves us a problem it's all very well saying that how do we get around the fact that those relationships that we said happen organically are no longer happening in a dispersed team we start out with distributed team culture rules and how we go about making our teams feel like all part of one team reject us versus them that one's an obvious one that is oh yeah designers they all think like that or developers are all like that don't listen to them or that crowd in that country uh oh, forget about them you need to stomp out that language you're all one team it needs to feel like that 
Team transparency. When you're in the same office as someone, I can walk past your monitor and go, oh, that's interesting, tell me about it. I'm not doing it to make sure you're working. I'm doing it because I'm interested in what you're working on. I'm trying to build that relationship. That's how developers get more empathy with designers and the issues they face and vice versa. So how can we get this team transparency remotely? Well, one of the things we always do is make sure all backlog, all work in progress, all finished work is completely visible to every team, even if it's not something that they're working on. They're all invited to each other's show and tells. Everyone can see exactly what each other's working on. They can see what they're learning about. They can distribute the, uh, all of those learnings. Employee rotations, another obvious one. It's just about getting people to swap, go to another office every now and then, maybe once a quarter, once a month, whatever your team needs to do to bridge that gap, that distance gap, to get those relationships going. In some cases, we've got people doing two weeks in one country, two weeks in another. In some, it's uh, less often. It really depends on the situation. Always use video chat. This is an interesting one. So you've probably experienced this, that British people are really bad at English. We use a lot of slang, use a lot of idioms. We don't finish the sentence always, and we just go, oh, yeah, they'll figure it out. And it's really hard to know what we're talking about. And we have these accents as well, which probably don't help. It's very common for British people to go into a video conference room and turn the video off, and then for the other person in the other side, who's also British, to turn theirs off and go to this separate room with all the cameras and just turn everything off and talk. Really bad at doing it. So one of the things I always make sure I do, and it's the same for any native speakers, one of the things I make sure I do is always have video chat signed up for everyone, just so that they can see how my hands are moving, see my face, they can see I'm smiling and that it's a joke, because sometimes that won't always come across. It's really important to sign up to do video chat. You can see the person, you can see their eyes. One that we completely recommend. Oh, and you need to take it a step further. Make your socials video chat socials as well. Doesn't sound the most exciting, but what I mean by that is having a team breakfast, a team lunch, but having that with a video chat element too as well. And then you've got to do those uh, cringeworthy games that people do to get to know each other. That's not going to happen naturally now you're dispersed, so everyone is going to have to do these on the call. My favorite is uh, two truths and a lie. Have you heard of this one? You say two true things about yourself and one lie, and everyone else has to guess which one's the lie. And it's great because no matter what, you'll learn two truths about the person. You learn two things about every person in the room. And they're usually the most interesting things that you can go and pick up, make a relationship about. You've got to force these things into that video chat. Set up office windows. Now, I don't mean install Microsoft. Um, what I mean with this is when you're in an office with someone else, whether you're a bunch of product managers and you've got your product director, I can go up to you and say, oh, I need you for five minutes just at your desk. And I can ask, ask a couple of questions. I don't need to put in a whole meeting. I can just go and ask them. How we emulate that at distance is we'll set up iPads with FaceTime bridges to the different locations. I'll have a few on my desk. They'll have them in their location and they can just go and pick it up and go, hey, have you got a minute? Yep, let's chat. And they can get that connection. I've seen this where people have done it with, they'll put a huge uh, Microsoft Surface Hub or something like that, and the whole office is broadcast from both locations. I would recommend against that. Uh, everyone just feels like they're being watched and they're in Big Brother. <laughs> Don't think that's the best way to go, but if it's worked for you, let me know. Everyone connects with users. Uh, we've said it through all of these talks about being user-centric and really caring about the user, but it can be hard to get that connection if you're in a different country, speaking a different language, and you're in, in a dispersed team. We make sure everyone gets every single transcript, translation of it, video recording of every user interview, and that they're shown on show and tells. So not only do they have access to it, but there's also a set time where everyone watches the highlight reel, sees the insights that come out of it, and really feels connected to the user. And if we have to translate, we translate. It's really important that they feel connected to who they're building this for, because that's where the best ideas come from when you can really empathize. We always make sure everyone signs up to this. It's no point just printing this off, putting it on the wall and saying, great, we're good to go. Enron had their values in the lobby and it said integrity. It doesn't work if you just put it on the wall. People go to jail. Get everyone to sign up to this as a contract. 
not an actual legal contract, but here's our team rules. Everyone do their signature. Everyone sign up to this. We're going to follow it. We're going to keep each other in check. And then we actually make it part of appraisals, reviews. Did you follow our culture? Did you do this? Did you always use video chat? Or did you use the excuse the hotel doesn't have great Wi-Fi? Make sure people sign up to this. Next stage where it goes wrong is ideate. And we've had so many questions on this at every uh, We've done this in Dusseldorf and in Munich before, and we get this same question every time. And it's great to show this slide about ideation because we've had the same question here as well, is how do you stop the boss just telling you what the idea is? It's the same one that keeps coming up. The reason being, there was a piece of research in the Harvard Business Review not so long ago, and uh, managers overvalue their ideas by 42%, but frontline employees undervalue theirs by 11 so what's this lead to? It leads to managers being overly confident about what the idea is, but they also have the power to make it happen. And you have frontline employees who actually meet the user and know what's going on, not being confident enough and don't have the power. How do you change this? How do you change someone's mind on this? How do you get them to see the idea is a bad idea, if it is a bad idea, or even just test it? One of the usual answers is, you know, you get this person to come and watch a user interview. You get them to a usability test. They observe, they then empathize with the user, and it's fine. But what happens if the person says something like this? Okay, that makes a lot of designers cry. And what happens if you're, this is a real quote, by the way. And what happens if another customer tells you this? Oh, we only, we only have two types. They only want to do two things. Forget jobs to be done. You know, yeah, forget about that. They've got two types of customer, and that's it. Or my favorite, which is the ultimate. We don't need the validation. I already know everything there is to know about this industry. How are you going to change this person's mind? How are you going to get them to come along with you to actually do this methodology, this approach? How are you going to get them to change? Well, the thing is, this person typically is usually so far away from the user that they can't actually empathize with it anymore, can't actually empathize with the user's journey, with the plight, how it works. An example of that we had, oh, in fact, let me go back a step. What's the answer to this? I would say it's make them eat their own dog food. Now remember, I said British people can't communicate. What do I mean by make them eat their own dog food? I mean, make them feel like the user again in short terms. So let's go into an example of what we did and where we faced this problem and where one of those, uh, one of those quotes came from. Our business owner in this uh, situation, financial services, they didn't believe the future of banking was all mobile and no store and no shop kind of thing and no physical location. They believed people still wanted to come in they wanted banking advice. They wanted to see that it was all safe. They wanted that whole brand experience and feel like the users always did. He thought uh, the trends of Revolut, Monzo, N26, all of, all of these guys, uh, they were just fads that millennials were doing because they don't have enough money yet to get real banking. Um, <laughs> it's true. That's what they said. Um, how do you then change that person's mind? Because it's been so long since that person's actually banked. Their assistants did their banking. They don't know the plight of the user. They've not signed up for a bank account for years at this point. So what we did is we did usability testing with them as the user, but not just on their own product, with the competitor product as well. We put them in the, in the lab and we give them the standard set of stuff to do. Sign up, make an account, do all these actions, and we measured the bad. No matter who you are, you still understand that time is a limited com uh, commodity. It's something you want to save. So anything that takes too long is bad. Everyone is time poor. No one has enough time. Fine, they can agree to that. More steps is worse, uh, is much worse than less steps. Less steps, simpler, better. Okay, we can all agree to that. So we got them to use their own product, sign up, make your account, try to start banking, try to get it set up on your phone, all of these actions, steps, do the know your customer process, all of these different things, get them to go through it. Stopwatch, timed each one, time, uh, took down how many steps, how many clicks, all of these things, and we had a whiteboard 
that we put up and we just wrote exactly each step, how long it took, very visual in the room. We then got them to use the competitor. This was in the UK, so they signed up to Monzo in this case. It was, he, on their product, he was still waiting for something to come in the mail, still waiting for a post to come through. Uh, two hours later, all the Know Your Customer had gone through, full banking was done, Monzo was all ready, he could go and spend it on his phone. You could use Google Pay with the new credit card before he'd received the physical credit card. He was still waiting for the Know Your Customer email from his own product. When they went through that, we got this at the end. We're so far behind, we need to change. Could understand that it's time poor, they just got it. We didn't have to do this session again, because now we were trusted, we were empowered. Most of the problems in the enterprise is getting a trusted and empowered team. One where the leader doesn't get involved in things that change the way the product works and it's actually driven by a user-centric approach like we talked. The reason this works is we've made, it, made them think it's their idea. We've not changed their mind. Well, we have, but we've not had a discussion with them. We've not tried to convince them of anything. This whole thing was set up as let's just do a test. Let's see what the competitors are doing. They see what the competitors are doing. They saw it was better. Now they want to do it. This works because it's, it's like inception. It's now their idea. They now overvalue it by 42%. We didn't have a problem getting this implemented. Where does it go wrong next? Product backlog, usually the next big one. This is maybe the most common after the get over that person who's standing in the way. What usually happens is this. Uh, you can't get to a real MVP they want absolutely everything implemented because if they don't have everything implemented, it will never work. The whole product launch will fail if I don't have every single feature for every single use case. You need to implement it all. We had this situation. Uh, we had this in probably the biggest enterprise we'd worked with. So we started working them from the product uh, conception stage, i.e. What, what's the real problem here? And it was corporate social responsibility. In other words, every member of staff in this 200,000 person organization would be given two days a year to go and do charity work. They had to book it, they had to organize it and get approvals and such, but they could go and do it. It was, it was something that they used to uh, recruit people with. It was a big selling point. Less than 1% of those 200,000 used it. Our problem, staff do not use their CSR days. The reason was the process was really painful, lots of admin, kind of clunky and slow. The idea was nothing special. The idea is really simple. It should be as easy to book a charity day in this company as it is to book an Airbnb. That's all it was. But the problems we had were that this enterprise had never done a product approach before. They'd never gone through any of this. Everything would be brand new. And Agile was even still a new thing. They'd not even got around that sort of culture change, never mind the product culture change. And in this case, the product, this platform, it's a three-way marketplace. So instead of just having a buyer, in this, term, in this case, the staff that want a charity day, and the seller, the charity, putting up these opportunities, we also had the administration team. These people had to make sure it complied with the values of the company, that this charity was in line, that everything was legal, all of these things. Because it's a, a 200,000-person company. They protect the brand quite closely. So there's a lot of people involved in this as a marketplace. There was no pre-existing product or platform. Uh, everything was done by email, all really slow, why people didn't sign up. So there was nothing to build upon that we could immediately improve. Lots of internal stakeholders. This is a 200,000-person organization. They operate in nearly every country in the world. In every country in the world that they operate, they have one CSR lead. We had nearly as many stakeholders as there are countries in the world for this one, including the CEO, because the CEO was going to retire in a couple of years, and they wanted this to be their legacy. So we've got a lot of stakeholders with the CEO who all want to impress, get above other colleagues, and make themselves look good. And then every one of those stakeholders, as is the usual case, had a feature that was absolutely vital in their mind. But it was completely vital and they couldn't have this changed. So what do we do in this situation? Well, I can tell you the thing we don't do. We did this once, it was a bad idea. You do not get all those stakeholders together. 
That is the fastest way to waste an afternoon doing a value proposition I've ever seen. Um, you will get no decisions made. You'll get a lot of stuff to do afterwards. Everyone will say, what a great session, because it was really creative, but nothing will come of it. Do not get them together. We started as we normally would. We went and did our user interviews and we got our user journey maps and we saw what the as is and how painful those pain points brought those out. And we then plotted what it should be to be, what our platform should deliver for each of those user groups. Once we'd done all that, we went and spoke to our ultimate stakeholder, in this case, the CEO, and we agreed what our guiding principles are. So we had a question earlier about what happens if you've got users with conflicting uh, requirements or demands. The way we look at it in this marketplace is that we'd only prioritize one. We were going to prioritize staff and no one else. The way we looked at it is the charity is always going to put up stuff. If their portal or whatever they have to deal with isn't that good, that's fine. They'll still push their way through it. The people that we're going to look at, people that we're going to prioritize, the staff in this case. We had a few more guiding principles, but you get the idea. The next, time and cost. It's a 200,000 person organization. There's going to be marketing. There's going to be all the stuff that goes with getting that many people to know about it and to sign up. So we had a real deadline to hit. We also had our cost constraints also. So we agreed with the stakeholder what they were at this next stage and what our, after discovery, initial discovery was done, what our approach for MVP should be. We then go and meet every stakeholder team, never more than seven people in a room, more than seven, it's, it's a nightmare. We get those, we have them make their MVP just at the feature level, epic level, highest level you can, whatever you can get away with really, and then prioritize those. So which ones are most important and have that prioritized list. Once you've done all that, you put them all into this big unachievable MVP. It's fine for now, just make the big MVP. You then work with your team and you go, okay, guys, I know it's gonna be a bit finger in the air. It's not gonna be that accurate. But how many story points, how many things do you think we could get through? However you wanna measure it. What's, our, what's the velocity average we've done over the past few years? Let's just take that, what, whatever number we can go in with. And then you look at that unachievable MVP and you go, right, let's, let's give, Let's give some story points to that. Let's give it an idea of how long it might take to do this. With all that in hand, we then do a session we called the pen of power. We get that ultimate stakeholder back. We have our product, head of product design, head of engineering, product management, myself in this case. We're all in the room together. And on the wall, we put all of the MVP. It was bigger than this, but for simplicity's sake, this is what it looked like. We did it by domain, by each group that was interested in functionality, et cetera. Staff, the charity admin team, the actual charity team posting things, analytics, marketing, and so on. And we put that on the wall and we bring in the ultimate stakeholder. We had a deadline, uh, when was this? This would have been like June. And we had a deadline of just at the end of September to get version one out, which was fine. We were gonna aim for something simple, but the problem as we know is how to get there. So we show them this big MVP, that person knows the deadline, they know what they want to achieve. And the first thing they look at that and go, oh crap, that's too much stuff. We go, it's already prioritized, here's a pen, draw a line of what stuff should be left out. So they quickly draw a line. And then you say to them, well, from what you've left up, that like you're now saying is important for version one, we've worked out our sprint speed, We've worked out how long it would take to get this. Uh, that won't be delivered till January next year, based on estimates. So you're gonna have to either move the deadline, give us more money, or reduce scope. You never get any more money, you never move the deadline, so they quickly draw another line, and they reduce that scope right down. And that's where the final step comes in, the guiding principles. You go back to them and go, hey, but we said we'd always prioritize the staff, and we need to build in a bit of contingency. If you really applied those guiding principles we agreed at the beginning and all said were a good idea, where would you end up? And they draw their final line. And that's what we consider the real MVP. <laughs> Everyone was happy when we did this process. One of the reasons it works is they start from the future and they work their way backwards. They know what they're going to get eventually. 
people were very happy that we could pretty much commit to them that release two. If it didn't make it in release one, anything above the blue line was probably going to make it into release two. Anything above the red line, it's on the roadmap. We'll see what happens after launch. Anything below, well, you prioritized it this way. You know it wasn't that important. You got most of what you wanted. And the CEO agrees, so OK, fine. Because we've worked backwards instead of the other way around, we can get to the real MVP. So what happened after we did this? We got some great results we were very happy with. We were the first one to ever deliver on time because we were the first one that didn't allow the scope to get out of hand. We had excellent NPS for the target user types. The admin team didn't like us so much. They didn't get anything really in this project. They got emails as they always would. But the users that we wanted to sign up, we got over 50 uh, on the NPS scale. We went from less than 1% signed up doing charity days uh, of that 200,000 to 20,000 signups in the first two weeks. Uh, it's a testament to the marketing, but also how easy it was to sign up, which was the whole focus. Just sign up, apply, and the whole process will happen for you. Because of that jump to 10%, we had one very happy CEO. He's nearly got his target for what he wanted to do. And because of that, we never, again, similarly as before, we never had to do this session again because we now had trust established and we had an empowered team. People had seen how this process works. They'd seen the results it delivered. They weren't going to question it again. And we went on much in the approaches that you've seen earlier. And that's pretty much the main problem everyone faces in the enterprise, getting that trusted and empowered team. All of these tricks, all of these things we're showing, and really they are kind of tricks, because we're getting that person to think it's their idea and that this is the right way of going about it without it being a confrontational discussion or making them feel like they don't understand it. They've came to this conclusion themselves in a lot of cases in the way we try and run it anyway. This one is where it goes wrong very, very often and is if we talk about features that don't, make, don't get used in the final product, I think the biggest sin is not killing a product when it shouldn't be there and making a product continue to live when no one uses it, that means 100% of the features were useless. A startup would just simply run out of money. An enterprise will keep it going in a lot of cases because they don't want it to die. It was one of their first things. And even though they know failure isn't always the worst thing, they will keep it running. Usually, the answer people will say to this is to do objectives and key results. I know if people have come across that framework. It's the idea that objectives, what the business wants to achieve, and the key results, that show the objective is achieved are set at the top by the board. And then every team underneath, they will target an objective and how they can contribute to that key result. And then they will have their own objectives and key results that feed into that. There's a few that are very popular. The ones I always use, growth, profitability, people, quality, and user. People being the own team. It's really important to measure your own team being happy. However, when a business that's, well, an enterprise that's not done this before, they will get a product team, they will find out that they should do OKRs, uh, and they don't know how to do them, so they just tell the product team to come up with their own, and then the product team comes up with vanity metrics, metrics that don't show success, but they just look good. One of them is having a lot of users, by the way. That's just a vanity metric, unless you take others into consideration. They will see the product's got a lot of users. It's making no money. Acquisition cost is through the roof. But it's got a lot of users, and that was our OKR. So we put more money in, and we keep it going. What can you do in this situation to make sure that the decision, if not getting made, at least is getting considered and getting somewhere? Well, first, like anything, always make sure your objectives and key results are done collaboratively with the business. The business can't just let the product team design it themselves and be they've got to be wary of the vanity metrics of the pitfalls they've got to go into the wider business strategy or just simply won't contribute to the success of the business or the product have regular check-ins on this decision so quarterly when you have a review meeting of the program success product success have a dedicated 15 minutes Someone in the room is going to play devil's advocate. They're going to be the one saying we should kill the product and give all the reasons why. Everyone in the room has then got to defend why it should be there. It's got to be the 15 minutes to go and discuss the decision 
because otherwise people will go, yeah, it's fine. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. We've nearly run out of time on this meeting. Let's, let's do something else. You've got to make sure it happens. And then the most powerful thing, I don't know if anyone's come across this, having key performance indicators or key results paired with a key failure indicator. Have you heard of key failure indicators? It's a way of making sure you don't have a vanity metric, one that looks good, but actually doesn't help the success of your product. For instance, a pairing might be you want to grow revenue while maintaining gross margin. The key performance indicator is that you grew revenue, but the key failure is that you didn't maintain gross margin. Each positive also has a negative that can ruin it. As I said, user base grow, but if the user acquisition cost goes up, that's also not sustainable. It's really powerful to have these key failure indicators as well, because as much as you've got something that says carry on, you've got another one telling you to stop and that this should be killed. As a product manager, what's our advice? What are the tips and tricks we've picked up over the years that will help you personally as a, as a product manager for those in the room? One of them is the decision raiser, is what I've come to call it. If you have two features or two discoveries you want to do, and one takes three months and then delivers customer value, and the other takes six months and then delivers customer value, which one are you going to choose? Depending on how you ask the question, you might get a very different answer. If your whole basis is around impact the soonest, you'll end up with the feature in three months. If your whole thesis is impact in the longest time period, you'll end up with the six month one because you perceive that as being more value. Sometimes you don't have much more information as a team to go on than that. It's really important to have it set early on what your time horizon, i.e. how long before this product is, we think it's gonna be defunct, how long is it gonna be replacing something else, what is the time horizon, the life of this product expected right now? and then make your decision raiser off it. So your decision raiser could be something like, we will always prioritize impact the soonest because we're small, we need to grow fast, we're doing disruption, we need to make new avenues. Or it could be, we're trying to do it in the longest, the reason being, we're going for a product that's more architectural, it's gonna insert itself into a supply chain, we're gonna be part of a new value chain completely, and stability is important. Having that decision raiser will really reduce the amount of discussion that goes into a lot of the decisions of this nature because the whole team signed up to it. You don't have to stay with the same razor for the whole life of the product, that can change. You could vote as a team when to change it, but it's important to have this razor to actually, well, cut through the decisions. Empowering teams. As I said, a lot of enterprises are making these teams for the first time and they come from maybe more hierarchical structures. Maybe they don't feel as empowered to share ideas. And if you put them in a less structured, more empowered team setting, they may just retreat back to their old ways, go back to their old structures and not share their ideas or do anything or, or progress like you want them to. They'll just try and do things the old way. One of the things uh, we like to do, it's something that Make-A-Wish Foundation came up with for their employees. It's a really, nice, really easy, quick idea that gives great results, is you let each person make their own job title they still have their normal one, senior JavaScript developer, but they make one that's much more personal to them that really shows what their expertise is and what they can do. So you could be the Angular Merkel of JavaScript, instantly rememberable. It would tell you that this person's got a bit of a sense of humor. They're not just a senior JavaScript engineer, they're actually specializing in front end in Angular framework and specifically. And they're German with a sense of humor, maybe. For King of Kanban, you're not just a scrum master or agile coach. You're now actually someone who specializes in Kanban and you pride yourself on how, uh, how the level of expertise in that area and how you can share it. These are incredibly powerful for the team because everyone has a lot of fun doing them. They learn a lot about each other. They learn what people think their strengths are and what they're proud of and how creative they all are as well. And it becomes very memorable. We have, uh, we've had a couple of instances where the person's like, what was that guy's name? The one that was the king of Kanban. And you go, it's David. And they go, oh, right, OK, so David. I was talking to him, really interesting. People end up remembering these more than the others. And the sense of power that comes to the person when they get to choose this and show their identity 
can sometimes really break them out of that mindset they had in the hierarchy because they've gone from you know senior javascript engineer reporting into a expert level to actually i'm the angular merkel of javascript i know what i'm doing lean tool sets uh there's lots and lots of tools out there and if you're working even in a co-located team or a distributed team it can still be a real problem of having too many tools within the product team if your product team is using google drive onedrive and slack and then uh, skype for this and zoom for that and all of these different platforms to communicate to do work in progress to do whatever it is to manage because each one fills a separate niche it's not going to work the key things are the transparency and over communication and if we want to enable that we have to have a lean tool set where everyone can see what's going on and avoid task switching. Task switching reduces productivity of the team like crazy. Try and remove that out and keep it lean. What do I do now? What are the top three things I would say to take from this talk to go and do when you get back to your desk? KPIs and KFIs. I think one of the biggest problems I've seen and the most expensive problem I've seen in the enterprise is not killing stuff early enough. Having this set can make it much more powerful. For me personally, having my decision raiser defined with the team, it's very easy to work with the team then. It shows how consistent and how easy, what to expect. And then finally, if you're working with the distributed team, or even if you're not, if you're working with a co-located team, it doesn't really matter. Do that exercise of defining your culture rules for your team, for your product, and have them sign up to it. It's incredibly powerful. It'll make that culture change we talked about earlier a bit more easy. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs>